Hello and welcome to the Real Estate Regroup Show. I am your host, LJ Walker, a real estate investor helping you realize your dreams of owning a home or investing in one. So recently, I saw someone advertise themselves as being the mortgage eliminator. His name at the moment uh, escapes me. But he said some things that were quite disturbing to me because they were not true. And I saw people applauding him in the comments. And I'm like, oh, wow, that is very, very dangerous because what he is saying can get people into a lot of trouble. So let me go blow by blow, if you will, of some of the things that he said that I had an issue with. And why uh, red flags are all over the place for me. And why I want you to be very careful when it comes to dealing with this person. And also anybody else who might call themselves a mortgage eliminator. Now, let me say this also. There are some people who are legitimate when it comes to naming themselves mortgage eliminator. Those people who are legitimate are giving wise legal and financial advice. Okay, but this particular person, and there may be a few others, they're not giving you accurate legal advice. Um, the advice that they give will make you lose your home and it may also have you go to jail. So that's another reason why I feel that it is important for me to come out and say something and speak about this thing. Uh, yes, this person was reviewed on another podcast, but they didn't hear the full video or they didn't listen to every single thing that he said. They only took you know, bits, one, as a matter of fact, they only took one piece of what he said and ran with it and said, you should not invest with him. Well, what I did is I listened to everything he said and my mind is blown away. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Let's get started. He says that mortgages or most mortgage contracts that are given out are unilateral that's actually not true all mortgages are bilateral banks and private lenders and mortgage companies do not force anybody not here in the United States they don't force people to buy houses they don't force people to do business with them okay and it is bilateral because not only is your name on the contract, the bank's name is on the contract. A bank's representative's name is on the contract or mortgage company or private lender, how investment banker, however, which way you choose to buy your property. Someone else's name is on that paper besides yours. Okay. The next thing he says is that when you're the buyer, you're also the private lender. Again, that is not true. If you are the buyer, you are not the lender. The bank, the mortgage company, they are the lender. They are actually lending you money so that you can purchase a home. The next thing that he says is that the purchaser, the buyer, and the seller are all in the same. You're not the seller if you're the buyer. The seller is the person who already has the home, who is selling it to someone else like yourself who wants to buy the home. So the two of you are not the same person. And the contract should clearly state that. And most contracts do clearly state who is the purchaser, who is the seller, and who is the lender. Next. He was saying that uh, when you sign the contract that banks use your credit to make 
certain financial maneuvers and that your credit is actually what is financing the contracts. Now, this is not true either. The reason why banks ask for your credit score is because they want to feel comfortable with loaning the amount of money that you need in order to buy the property that you're interested in. But your credit does not finance the contract. It does not finance the whole transaction. Okay. Uh, the next thing he was saying that uh, many people don't realize that they don't have to give up their social security number and that if your credit is to be run, um, you have to authorize the, the bank or the lending institution to do so. Well, honestly, uh, that part is true, but I, I don't know of any bank lending institution, etc., that does not run your credit check. They all do when you're applying for a loan, from, from my understanding. Well, no, correction. Because you can, they are offering loans, especially a few today, where they're not looking at your credit. So those particular institutions will not. But the rest of them, yes, they, they will. But they also give you an authorization form to fill out that says, you know, if you want uh, their money, they require credit. Here's the authorization form. So you are, you are supposed to fill that out if you want that particular bank's money uh, for that particular loan. Because you do have some banks that offer more than one loan product. Okay. Hope I didn't throw you guys off. Next. He was saying that many times the terms and conditions are not disclosed that are in the contract. Well, to be honest with you, a banker does not have to tell you anything at all. You need to read that contract and make sure that all the terms and conditions are there. You need to ask questions if there are any terms and conditions that you don't understand. But as long as it's in writing on a piece of paper, it's been disclosed. So right, I, right there, that doesn't, that really doesn't make sense to me um, at all uh, when he when he says that. Next. He says that our signature is worth $1 million already so that the bank automatically has $1 million or collects $1 million because we signed the paper and our signature is worth that amount. That's also wrong, okay? The only people whose signatures are worth $1 million are dead politicians and celebrities that have been dead for over a hundred years, okay? If you have a piece of paper with their original signature on it, you can get a million dollars. But your own personal signature may not be worth that much, okay? Because you have celebrities uh, that may have died last year, 10 years ago, and their signature is only worth a couple of thousand dollars. You, if you're an average person, you're not a politician, you're not a celebrity, you probably won't get a thousand dollars. You're lucky if you'll even get a hundred. But if you want to find out how much money your signature is actually worth, you can go to an appraiser and pay them thirty dollars to find out. But I'm telling you off the bat that your signature right now is not worth a million dollars. It just isn't. The next thing that he said was that the state takes over your property in foreclosure and that mortgage companies can't foreclose on your property. Only the IRS can. 
This is so not true. Mortgage companies, banks, lenders, anybody in that area can foreclose on your property. Can put a lien on your property. It's not just the state. It is not just IRS. Okay, so that that's a that's a very 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 big one. It, I'm telling you, if you don't pay your mortgage, they can foreclose on you. They can take your house. Okay, next he loves to bring out section 15 USC 1602 okay and he says that in this particular section this particular law says that when you uh, sign your mortgage and you pay the closing costs that you pretty much bought the house that that's it that's not true if you go to http colon backslash backslash www.law.cornell.edu slash us code slash text slash 15 slash 1602 you will find that it is just a bunch of different definitions okay and in there Nothing in there says that once you sign once you sign the papers and give the closing costs that you own the home. Nothing in there says that your signature is worth one million dollars. Nothing in there states that. So I'm not sure what or what part of that he is referring to. He claims that he studied law, but I he never said exactly where he studied law. Granted, I only took business law in college. Granted, I've only worked at law firms for about 25 years. I am not a lawyer, okay? However, I do know how to read. And I did read that uh, law that he mentioned and I don't see it but if you see it please let me know <laughs> but I am telling you for a fact that banks do and will foreclose on your property if you do not pay all right uh, next thing so that's that's like a, a big red flag for me. I'm sorry. It's a big red flag. And I'm going to say this also. Another red flag for me is the fact that he rents. He's never owned property. As a matter of fact, he was homeless first. And now he's renting. Why is it a red flag? You have to listen to people who have experience in the area that you wish to go into. If you want to be a homeowner, you need to talk to other homeowners. You got to speak to home buyers. You have to speak to uh, banks, lawyers. This person on the internet, you know, who who's rented and never owned, that is a red flag for me personally. And I saw, you know, some people in the comments saying, oh, these are gems. Mm. There, there's just so there there's just so much wrong uh with what he has said um that's so it, it's not factual you know and i'm not sure when what he said was ever factual to be quite honest with you because i do understand that sometimes information may be true one day and then because the laws change, they're not so true the next day. But I, I don't think that this is the case. All right, so let's go into the procedures in which he claims he will use in order for you to get back your home. 
or to get you from not having to pay your mortgage. He will collect $30,000 from you. Now, I don't know if that includes court costs or if there are court costs on top of the $30,000 that he will charge you. Okay, here's my thing. That $30,000 could just go into paying your mortgage. And as far as court costs are concerned, I know that they can cost $2,500 up to $7,000 nowadays when it comes to taking a bank to court. So that's, that's quite a bit of money. And on top of that, he says that for him normally to have this, have you set up where you don't pay your mortgage will take six to 12 months. He doesn't say what will happen if you lose. And he seemed as though uh, that was not a possibility. Listen, when you go to court and you sue someone, know that you might lose. And especially if it's a bank, uh, not only will you lose your money, you may also lose your home, especially with six to 12 months of mortgage not being paid. All right. How he plans on doing this or, or the steps that he uses is that he makes people file bankruptcy chapter 13. But the thing is with chapter 13, um, basically it, it still allows you to repay all or part of your debts. It's just that it stretches it out over three to five years. So that still doesn't say that it, it's eliminating your mortgage. You're still going to pay. All right. And then he mentioned something about, um, he also goes to another court to sue the bank so that you can get a million dollars a year. That's a red flag for me because in essence, that's a promised return. You don't know if you're going to win the case if you go with this person, right? You, you don't know if you're going to win the case or if you're going to lose the case. If you lose, you you may not get a million dollars a year. You're definitely not going to get a million dollars a year. But let's say you win somehow. Uh, you could win and still not get a mil million dollars a year. You might get less. But to be quite honest with you, I don't think you will get anything. Because I, I don't believe that this is true. The next thing that he mentioned later on is that banks are supposed to give you forbearance. The truth is banks don't have to give you forbearance. You have to qualify for forbearance. And I guess that's something uh, that many people don't realize Because uh, in order to qualify, you have to prove to the banks, to the lender, to the mortgage company, to the debt collectors, that you have reduced your expenses. And if it shows that you did not take measures to reduce your expenses, then you can be denied forbearance. So that part right there is a no-no. Um, that part there is a, is a red flag for me because he's stating that they have to give it to you. They don't have to uh, give you forbearance, especially if you financial, if they feel you don't financially qualify. And then next, another thing that I heard in one of the testimonials is that uh, they wrote off the home as a church. 
Well, they didn't go into details, but what I do know is that in order to write off your home as a church, your home has to be in your church's name and not in your personal name. The home has to be used for religious services or to house the clergy, the officiating clergy of that church. Okay, so again, guys, red flag. Sometimes I see uh, people say, oh, the, these people are dropping gems. Oh, my God. Uh, this is wonderful information. I don't know if, if, if the people who are saying this are being paid to say it, but it is simply not true. It really is not true. You have to be very careful with the information that's being pushed out here. When you hear anything here, um, even if it's me, please call, check, and verify. Because like I said, I try to be on top of things, but I have made videos in the past that now the laws, they changed and things are different. You can't get it the same way as you did before. And then I did another video where the laws are the same, but the demand changed. As a matter of fact, the demand changed twice since I created that video. So that's why no matter who it is, check, verify. Uh, using services uh, like prepaid legal um, there may be even others out there that are similar is a good reference uh, to use to verify information go to your banks go to your accountants speak to people don't take everything that you hear on social media and run with it because sometimes you'll run and you'll run right out of money because not everybody on here is legit. Okay, so that's my information for you guys today. I hope that what I shared will help you make smart financial moves. Feel free to pass this amongst your friends. Remember, each one, reach one, teach one. Bye for now. Until next time, have a good night.